Uh, my name is Anais Lopez, and I am the Executive Assistant and Membership Manager here at MOCA GA. Um, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to Jose Ibarra Rizzo's exhibition of A Depth Within a Gaze. So I, before we begin, I would like to thank our major funders, the Charles Lorden Foundation, the Antonori Foundation, the AEC Trust, with additional support from the National Endowment for the Arts. Mocha GA is entering its 17th year of the Working Artist Project Program with their, with their support. I would also like to thank Jose for gracing us with this exceptional body of work, Vivian Lee, the 2023-2024 guest curator, and lastly, a big thanks to the MOCA GA team. So Jose Ibarra Rizzo is, an American, is a Mexican-American multidisciplinary artist living and working in Atlanta, Georgia. His, wor his work primarily focuses on identity and is currently exploring the migrant experience in the American South. Primarily working with photography, Jose also utilizes drawing, painting, and sculpture in his creative process to convey genuine human narratives. Jose is the recipient of the inaugural Mint and ACP Emerging Artist Fellowship, one of the three awards of the 2022 Atlanta Artadia Award, <laughs> and one of the three winners of the 2023-2024 Working Artist Project Fellows from MOCA GA. His work lives in the permanent collection of the High Museum of Art and the Virginia Museum of Fine Art, and his clients include Rolling Stone Magazine, Time Magazine, and the New York Times. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thanks for being here. Hey. Hey. How are you? Good. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna start with a couple questions and we're just gonna kind of flow with it. Um, and at the end, we'll open it up for a Q and A. Um, I'm gonna have someone on, Maggie on our staff is gonna come around and pass the mic around. So wait for the mic, that way everybody can hear your question. So Jose, um, obviously we all know you're a photographer. That's why we're here. But a lot of people might not know that you actually started off as a painter. Um, could you share with us? Could you share with us a little bit about your transition from painting to photography? Yeah. So um, my artistic journey really begins um, in college. You know, I I come from an immigrant family, so choosing to study art was a big leap, right? A big leap of faith. And my background has always been. Um, in drawing and painting, particularly in those times. Um, so fast forward to post-college, I was going through this really difficult time and a depression, and I wasn't making a lot of work. Um, I met my fiance around 2016, and she's a professional wedding photographer, and she introduced me to the medium. And what I found photography to be was a way to make images and process them at a faster pace than I did drawing or painting. Because I'm very, I, don't, I guess I could call it thorough, but I like to really take my time with, with my painting. So it would take me months to make a painting and I could argue that I never really finished a painting. Um, so that really messed with me mentally, right? So photography was like a really nice solution to that, that I can make an image, think about it, and then move on, right? And that helped me really mentally. And, you know, it was, it was such a gift because it just happened almost by accident. Um, it's opened so many doors, but it, it really speaks to the way that I view the world. Another big uh, reason why I switched to photography was I wanted to make films, right? So it's like, I'll start by teaching myself photography and then maybe I can make my way towards filmmaking, right? So I think about like moving pictures and I'm starting to kind of uh, experiment with that, but it's like at the end of it, whether it's like portraiture through painting or through photography, I really enjoy storytelling. So that's really what it comes down to. It's like I have all this media that I like to work with. How can I best tell the most compelling story? Thank you. Going off of what you said about portraiture, so you were doing that as a painter and then that kind of like transitioned into the photography. What about it draws you to taking portraits of people or painting portraits of people? You know, like human experience, it's like, I know that sounds really cliche, but 
that really speaks to me. I think people's individual journey, their own stories, like I, I, that really resonates with me, right? And if I have this, whatever, artistic talent, and if I can, you know, maybe raise some awareness about uh, people's experiences that don't often get spoken about, then I like to use whatever platform or skill or gift that I have to do so. So, you know, it all starts with like, my family, you know, thinking about our own experience as immigrants, um, the crazy journey we've been through to be here, um, all those things inspire me, right? So it all comes down to people, mm -hmm. right? And humans and how, how are we, how, what's the best way to, to tell human stories? And yeah, so again, I, I'm being redundant, but it's like, although I was making portraits with painting, like, I'm really almost doing the same thing with photography, mm -hmm. right? It's telling stories. As you were talking, I was thinking about, you know, I also come from an immigrant background. I think our stories kind of align in our culture, both being Mexican-American and growing up in the South. And um, I'm wondering the title specifically, Depth Within a Gaze. What, 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 what are you trying to materialize in these portraits and, and in what you see in your everyday, like when you're walking out and you see something and maybe you're like, oh, I need to like take a little, like what is it, snip of that? Like how does that materialize for you? Yeah, so when I was thinking about the title, um, you know, titles are a challenge, at least for me, right? I wanted a title that really spoke to what I'm trying to convey, right? Although I'm making portraits, I mean, maybe it's, it's not something that I need to say, but there's so much layers and complexity and nuance to my subjects that often isn't portrayed, right? Or isn't spoken about, right? Particularly when you say, like, when the rhetoric around immigrants isn't always in a positive light, right? So my photographs and the collaborations that I make with my subjects are really trying to show them in the light of like with dignity but also where you can kind of get a glimpse of what their life looks like right because um, I think a lot about like we we live in such a we, we work in America like that's literally what we do here right and I say that in contrast to like our home countries like when I go to Mexico it's a whole different experience here it's like you're working 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 and a lot of times we're just moving so fast that we don't really get to see what the people in our community go through or how they make a living, so on and so forth. So like, I, I try to make images that kind of shed some light on what that experience is for other individuals outside of our, our community or, or what we're exposed to. So when you first walk into the space, you're immediately met with that sculpture piece that's over there with the buckets filled with flowers. And I really love how it's diagonal to this image back here of Maria, who is selling the flowers. And I wanted to know um, a little bit about her and why you decided to place it that way. So for a long time, I've been thinking about how, do I, how can I push beyond the photograph, right? Because it's already very challenging to make a compelling photo. We're bombarded with images constantly, right? Everyone has a professional camera in their hand with the phones and megapixels, so on and so forth. So that's already a challenge in itself. How can you make something that, that's layered with complexity, that's both beautiful, et cetera? Um, so that's the challenge itself, but also an image really only tells you so much, right? So like. I've been thinking about um, sculpture and how sculpture can kind of aid to tell the story, right? Um, this portrait of Maria, um, when I first saw her, I was just like so moved with, with what she was doing. She was like standing on the curve at a gas station, um, just like selling these flowers. And, um, you know, I go back home a lot and seeing her like really stood out because like I, I, I I frequent these areas, right? So um, I was like, I need to, I need to go hear her story. Um, Maria comes from South Carolina down to, to Gainesville to sell these flowers. Um, and they make this 
this trip almost every weekend. Um, it's her brother's uh, business, so like she'll be posted up in one gas station, another sibling or two will be elsewhere, right? And they'll, they'll, they'll just do this like almost every weekend. Uh, it was particularly cold this day, um, and I approached her and I was like, hey Maria, you know, I'm, I do this project where I kind of want to like tell our story and, and share our experience and how diverse it is and complex, so on and so forth. And she was like all about it. She's a 16 year old immigrant. Uh, she had just been here at the moment I photographed her for like two months. She said that she wanted to take her shot here in America, that she didn't really like being in school and that she wanted to really pursue a better life with her siblings. So I, it's like, I think in America, like, well, particularly in the South here, where it's not really, at least in, the, in my community, it's more common to see street vendors, but that in itself is so new. Like, um, and f particularly for her, her confidence, her, you know, she's not shy about it. She's making a living, she's hustling. Um, but the confidence that she carried herself with really spoke to me, right? She's, she's here, she's, she's in the cold. Um, anyways, so like, I really wanted to show that like, the ability of for us to like make a living or make it happen whatever way possible right like there's there's literally no excuses and maria maria's making it happen so i wanted to pay tribute to her and all the street vendors because um the gentleman over there who's um selling corn um in the back of his truck you know there's so many examples of that in my community of how can we make it happen right so those kind of stories really speak to me could you tell us about the little flowers around the room? Because he told me about that oh, earlier, yeah. and I loved them. The flowers. So when I first met Maria, she didn't have these roses. Um, and like, I really wanted to like make a whole movie about Maria because she's just so inspirational, right? And it's, it's so, it's just like, I don't know. It's so moving, her story. Um, but like, I was driving one day, and I saw like what I thought were like these heart-shaped glass things. And there really weren't hearts. They were just like these bubbles. And I realized that there's like roses in them. And I was just like so like intrigued by like, what, what are those? So I approached her and I was like, oh, Maria, like what are these? Did you make these? And she's like, yeah, um, yeah. She didn't really tell me how they're made. But um, I was like, I, I think this is a really good opportunity to show her hand in this exhibition, right? Her family's hand. Um, because they make these. Uh, my budget wasn't unlimited, so they're like 45 bucks each. So I bought as many as I could. If, if I had enough funds, I'd fill this whole space with those. But, um, you know, I felt good to support them in that sense, but also to show their hand. You have two pieces in here that really speak on identity. And it's the one behind you, Nayeli and Jesus by his car, right? And I'm wondering why you decided to include those two pieces where you can very distinctly see the Mexican flag in one and then the Mexican and American flag in the other. I spend so much time thinking about duality, like our duality, right? Um, in both the sense of like being proud to be Mexicano, being proud to be first generation, um, but like the, uh, for instance, Don Jesus, who's like both proud to be American and both to be Mexican. And I think there's this conception that like we have allegiance to like only one, right? And I've been, I've been going through that um, journey myself of like, who are you? Like, who are you, right? How are you creating space? How are you creating your own identity here? because I am first generation. Um, a little background, I got here as an undocumented immigrant at the age of seven. I'm now a US citizen, um, but it's been like a whole journey, like to try to both create that new identity. And when I see people, particularly like Nayeli, who like wear their identity with so much pride, that really speaks to me, both because I 
grew up in a time in the South where we were encouraged to assimilate, right? So like we would dress like white kids, like that's, that was the norm. Um, and now there's been a cultural shift. It's been like, we take pride in who we are, right? And it's particularly the youth that I see it in. And that's just really inspirational. So that's, that's kind of why I'm including people who, who really take pride in both the duality of, of their, their cultural heritage. I think that's really important. Um, a few weeks back, we had a field trip, a big group of students from up, up near Gainesville, and a lot of Latino students who came on that field trip. And I remember one student in particular bringing those two pieces up and being like, it's nice to see the flag on the walls. And I was just like, you're right. And that stays with me. And when I walk around the space, that stays with me. And even when we're talking like not in front of a bunch of people, that stays with me. It's beautiful. <laughs> so, um, as we can all see, there's a lot of pieces of portraits or pictures of portraits, but you do have a couple of images of landscapes. Um, and one thing that I noticed in all of them is kudzu is present. Um, and so, can you talk a little bit about why you decided to include these pieces, but also more importantly, why you decided to layer an image of your grandfather, who was a migrant, over images of the kudzu, which is known to be invasive in the South. Yeah, so a lot of my work incorporates both the landscape and the figure, right? So I spent a lot of time looking around what's around me. And, you know, it. I guess I spent time not really noticing it, but like for the past two or three years, I've been seeing like the kudzu just overgrow and overtake certain parts of the landscape. And I just found it so beautiful, right? I'm definitely not the first photographer to photograph kudzu. It's actually now that I've like become conscious of it, there's like plenty of images about kudzu. But when I, when I was started researching it and I learned that it was an invasive species, there's something about it that, you know, it's, it's both seasonal, like in the winter it dies and then it, it flourishes back up in the summers and spring. So thinking about that as an element of my own family's history and own journey of being here. Um, before my last exhibition in 2023, I had no idea that my grandpa had been here in the 60s in Tennessee working cotton fields, part of a bracero program. Like I, that was not known to me. That was not like general knowledge about my family. And I, I'm over here thinking that my family's the first to be here in the South. And that was really, that was really like eye opening, right? Like that, like we've been here in a very literal sense. And that seasonal transition that my grandpa lived through because he decided to go back. A lot of, many men did it. Um, for context, the Bracetto program was an initiative in the 60s to fill the gaps of uh, men who were working World War II and they were no longer working these, these, these fields. So, you know, the country needed to be fed. So they implemented this program where they hired temporary Mexican workers. So my grandpa was part of that program. And that's how he ended up in Tennessee. Um, anyways, long story short, making that connection of both my dad leaving home at, this, at 16, um, because my grandpa couldn't offer him anything else. He's like, you need to go make your own life and spending time in California and going back and forth and, you know, like saving up money to build his first home back in Mexico. And like that seasonal transition, that's kind of where I make the overlap with the kudzu. So trying to make those connections and, and letting the landscape kind of speak for itself too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this piece right here with the videos. So I'm gonna be honest. I finally watched the whole thing through recently, earlier this week. Um, and I just, I stood over it and watched the whole thing a couple times. Um, and there were a lot of images in there that reminded me of my childhood, which is really great. There was one in particular that just like threw me back in time. Um, and it's the one where it seems like you're overlooking at the apartment complex. There's, there's the kids playing in whatever limited field is available in the apartment complex. 
And it's clearly sometime after six because all of the work trucks are back in the parking lot again. And I think I counted like seven of them with ladders on top of it. Um, that is my childhood, perfectly captured in an image. And I wanna know, like, what were you doing? Like, where were you and what were you doing where you like looked over and you're like, oh, let me take a, a snap of that real quick. I actually go to that spot so many times. It's in Doraville. Okay. And it's, it's like, it's got this beautiful, like, open area. It's got this, it's right in front of the CDC. And it's, I bet I need to go check it out. Um, but I just drive there and I'm just so fascinated by it that I just want to spend hours with the people, with the community. And I, I keep going back to it. I have yet to make the image I want to make there. But I, it was so important. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll get to this piece, but there's certain areas that are so special because mm -hmm. it's those symbols, like the work trucks with the ladders, the kids playing, like those are special moments. Yeah. And there's, I, you know, I have a limited amount of wall space, right? And like I said, video is like something that I'm really wanting to lean into. So like I saw this as an opportunity to kind of expand on what's on the walls and kind of paint a bigger picture about the things that I'm looking at, the places where I'm, I'm photographing, and yeah, to kind of give you more context. Um, there's a small clip of like, literally a, like a digital portrait, like yeah. where, um, where- He's like on his bike after yeah, the- Yeah, his nickname is Crazy. Crazy, okay. Yeah. Um, and he's just like staring at you and that, that's kind of the direction which I want to take this work in, right? Okay. I want it to live in different ways. Mm -hmm. So um, my apprentice assisted me in this, Noah Reyes, uh, thinking about sculpture too, like how can, how, can, um, you, how can I use sculpture to expand on video, but also like the use of dirt, like in the literal sense of like, what does the land reveal, which is why I'm using the dirt and uh, with combining the photos and the videos. Um, I'm rambling now, but. No, no, no. Yeah. That's Georgia clay, right? That is, that is dirt from my backyard. I love yeah. that, yeah. <laughs> I love that. Staying on the subject of the, of the video, if you guys haven't seen it yet, you definitely should, because there's some really incredible images in there. There's another one that I thought of earlier this week. Um, so if you grew up in Atlanta and you grew up along Buford Highway like I did, there's this park called Dresden Park. Have you, yeah, <laughs> there's this park called Dresden Park. And uh, when I tell you that it's all paisas there, it's all Mexicans there. It's great. Like you go there and they're playing music. It's fantastic. You have an image in there of a bunch of guys playing soccer. And earlier this week, a friend and I went on Buford Highway, decided to get dinner, and we're like, let's go eat it at Dresden Park. And we're sitting on a hill, and I'm watching a bunch of guys playing soccer, and you come to mind, and I'm like, because it's, you know, sun setting, it's six, seven o'clock, and I'm like, I wonder what Jose would do with this. I wonder how you would capture those images. Crazy is recorded in Dresden Park. In Dresden Park? Park? Yeah. yeah. And I just made some new work in Dresden, in Dresden Park. I went. Y'all need to go to that park. It's nice. <laughs> it's it's these these little pots. Of, yeah. Like, of literally land that mm -hmm. um, people in our community, working class people, inhabit, and they literally give it life. Mm -hmm. And those particular communities are what really gets me going. So you know, I after work, you know, I try to just just be there and exist there. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story about it. An image I just made, uh, I, I parked at Dresden Park, and I see these two guys, um, these two Guatemalan guys, and they're arm wrestling. I think, wow, that's the most beautiful thing I, <laughs> I've seen in so long. <laughs> and, um, and I'm like, I'm like, man, I should, I, how do I approach them? How, what's, what's the common ground here? Um, so I'm like, I go and sit by like a bench, like two benches away from them, and I'm just kind of staring at them, building up the courage, and people start to leave. Um, and then I'm like, all right, I'm just gonna go for it. I'm like, what's up guys? Uh, I'm Jose, and they're just looking at me like, dude, like, what do you want? 
I'm like, guys, like y'all were arm wrestling. Like that was so cool. Can I please take a picture of y'all? And then they're like, they both look at each other and they kind of giggle. And then they're like, okay. And I'm like, all right, amazing. And then, you know, part of the process is really like, do they have a comprehension of what I'm doing? Like, I need to make sure that that's very clear. So I share the story about this ongoing portrait series that's been going on since 2021, where I document the migrant experience. Um, they get behind the idea and they're just like arm wrestling and I'm just taking pictures and it's just like, I don't know, it's just such a beautiful space and it's just people existing, right? And then, and the, that aspect, that's, that's really what wants, makes me pull my camera out, mm -hmm. like wanting to document those moments where um, people are just being people. I love that because I feel like people maybe outside of our community only really see us in the workplace on top of houses, doing yard work, behind a kitchen. Um, but very rarely do they see what we do after hours, which is cook out with the fam on a Tuesday night at the park, soccer game, music literally aliving an entire park with a little like makeshift soccer game going on. and. Those are important moments for us. Like, I think those are moments that we both grew up in a lot. Absolutely. Um, so looking around at the gallery, you know, all of your photos hold so many stories, especially of the everyday, the everyday mundane. Um, you know, kids playing soccer, guy riding his bike around the neighborhood. Why did you decide to include the piece on which had your Aguilar Mendes over here on this side. Yeah, so that's a heavier piece, a slightly darker in nature. Um, so much of what my work has been has been making images where I portray my subjects with dignity, right? To show them in a different light that we may be used to seeing. Um, but there's also like this really dark uh, and sad reality that people face. Um, this was back in December when I learned about Virgilio Aguilar Mendez. He's a 16-year-old uh, Guatemalan immigrant um, who was um, eating outside of his hotel, just um, eating at like a like a business, like a private business, um, just minding his own business. Really, just he's actually talking to his mom and eating. Uh, a police officer sees. Virgilio and um, approaches him and starts to question what he's doing next to this private business. Uh, Virgilio speaks mom, which is a predominantly spoken language, one of the two predominantly spoken languages in Guatemala. They have 23 languages. Don't quote me, but that's one of the predominantly spoken languages. So his Spanish isn't the best and he doesn't speak English. So there's already like multiple barriers with the officer and himself. When the officer asks him, you know, what's he doing? Um, he, he literally like hand signals eating, right? And it gets, it gets aggressive really quick. It gets ugly very quick um, because Vigilio can't comprehend what he's saying. And the officer starts to literally search him. Um, and the, the, the body cam footage is public. It, it was made, it was released. And you can see how fast things take a turn. Um, Virgilio has a pocket knife on him. For context, he works picking watermelons in Central Florida. Um, so that's why he had a, a, a pocket knife. Um, eventually, the cop calls for backup, and they just start beating him, tasing him, um, because in their eyes, he's resisting arrest and he's not giving them answers. Um, it goes from Virgilio saying, I'm sorry, uh, to him saying sandia, which is watermelon in Spanish, to let them know that the knife that he has is for his work. And then it turns to him screaming familia because he was such in such despair that all he wanted was to be with his family. Um, fortunately, things don't get worse for Vigilio. A Spanish-speaking officer comes and is able to kind of make things 
a little more chill and calm. Fast forward an hour later, um, the officer who originally approached Virgilio dies from an irregular heartbeat. So this particular county puts the charge on Virgilio for the death of that officer. Um, Virgilio uh, is almost locked up for almost a year. No uh, major news outlet picks this up, but the community picks it up and it's trending on TikTok. It's trending on social media to the point that ballads in our culture are like really big. They call them corridos. Virgilio ends up having a corrido because people are trying to push back at the injustice of this because it sends a really dangerous president for anyone that's involved in an altercation with a cop. Right, that's unheard of that if a cop arrests you and the cop dies, they could put that charge on you. Like, that's kind of unspoken of. Um, and just the, the brutality of it in itself is horrific. Um, so it, it garners enough attention that he gets these really um, prolific lawyers down in Florida. And fortunately, in uh, March, he's, he's released. Um, it's unclear whether they're wanting to deport him because he is here undocumented. So um, it's, it's then um, they determined, well, everyone always knew that they didn't have um, any foundation for those charges, so they get dropped. So this story is both really dark, but unfortunately ends with you know, Virgilio having his life because it could have been really bad. Um, but I wanted to showcase that this experience can both be really dark, right? I try to show a certain amount of beauty in my images. And I guess what I didn't say was I spend a lot of time with the Guatemalan community, particularly back home. There's been a very large influx of that particular community. Um, so when I saw Virgilio's story, I was like, I know Virgilio. I've, I've photographed people who, who are Spanish, like they, don't, they barely understand my Spanish, but we're able to communicate just enough. And when I saw this young man, I was like, I, I've seen Virgilio. I, I, I know this person. Um, I had just finished a project for the New York Times Opinion. And when I heard about this, case, I pitched it to them. Um, they originally said they were interested and later declined. But I wanted to tell the story. I wanted to find a platform, use the platform that I had to really shed light on this experience. Uh, hence why I made a, um, a painting of Virgilio's mugshot. Uh, you know, photography is a way of like telling lies, right? From a mugshot, you can assume that the person's a criminal. So I wanted to flip it. How can I give this person light, uh, nuance, complexity, uh, beauty? Um, so that's how the, the, the painted portrait came about. I think it really ties in the immigrant experience that, that we experience here in the South. Um, you know, Virgilio's from Florida and they have a lot of laws there that um, criminalize you on your appearance. Um, and just recently, Georgia passed a law, HB 1105, that does the exact same thing. And I'm wondering if you've given that any thought or if you, or like what has come to your mind in regards of what your subjects, the people that you take images of will look like in the next few months as this new legislation is put into effect or if you've given it any thought. I, I think maybe not in those terms, but it's an election year, mm -hmm. right? And certain rhetoric, rhetoric comes up during an election year, like words like invasion, uh, so on and so forth. So it is a very, it's a telling time. It seems almost like incredibly a very dangerous time to be an immigrant, mm -hmm. an undocumented immigrant here. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've, I'm constantly thinking about what does this experience look like and how we're gonna continue to like occupy space. Mm -hmm.
right? Because in the context of American history, at least in the South, like this feels also new, right? So I spent a lot of time thinking about that. Um, but yeah. With all that heaviness, there is one image in here that yells hope for me at least, since the picture of Phoenix. If you could tell us a little bit about our next generation of Mexican-Americans. Uh, Phoenix is uh, half Mexican and half African-American. It's even better. Um, and yeah, so I've had the opportunity to work with um, one of my subjects, uh, her name is Evie, mm -hmm. um, and she has a, a really big family, and her mom, her portrait's actually in this video piece. She's okay, got the yeah. eagle on her neck. She's badass. That's her yeah. mom. And um, I wanted to photograph actually the mom originally for this piece, but she brought Phoenix with her. And uh, Phoenix just has this energy, and uh, I needed to take the opportunity to make a portrait of her. Um, yeah, she just has this energy, like this confidence, like this will. Um, and How it's just, old is she? Do you remember how old she was? She's probably like four or something like that. <laughs> yeah, but no, like for sure, it's like the youth, like I know she's very young, but like the youth, that pride, that cultural pride that they have, mm -hmm. it's just so indicative of where we're heading. Yeah. Um, and super inspiring. Awesome. Well, with that, I'm gonna open up the floor for questions. Um, I'm gonna have the mic go around, so please wait for the mic. That way, we can hear your question. Um, the one thing that I noticed the most is your consistency. Can, can you hear me? The thing that I noticed the most in the consistency of your work is the way you use color. Um, can you, even in the painting, the colors are similar to the colors that you're choosing in the photography. Can you tell us about the way you relate to color in your work? Yeah, it's almost like something that happens subconsciously because sometimes I look at my images, I'm like, wow, they're very warm and sometimes a bit saturated and I get a little jaded about it. It's like, oh, why am I making these decisions? But I think it's just... I think it comes in like this this need to like paint my subjects in this light of dignity, right? That's that there's warmth that these are human beings. Um and it's just it's just like these palettes that I go to. And a lot of the images here are made on film and like there's a warmth to film that isn't so present in digital at times. And I really, I really enjoy that, that process that light hits these chemicals and creates this warmth. Also, I really enjoy shooting at the golden hour, right? Like that gives that certain color palette with the blues, the oranges. Um, yeah, and they're almost subconscious decisions. Sometimes I, I'm, I'm just like editing and it's just, it's just like, oh, well. And then I'm like looking at my whole portfolio and it's like, oh, these things are are adding up, and sometimes that's not the case, but yeah, it's just this palette that I'm very familiar with and that I really enjoy in my work. And I'm even really happy that it happens subconsciously because that's just kind of what I'm doing. And it's like I'm finding my own voice with color. Um, and yeah, thanks for that. Any other questions? Y'all can raise your hands and I'll come to you. Um, I wanted to ask about that image in particular because that reminds me so much of my childhood. I used to be that kid. I remember those cookouts so vividly um, and kind of relating back to the title of the show. I just see something in their gaze, but I was curious to see what, what you saw or what drew you to that or what the context was in that photo. So that's a really special photo for me. I think it's one of the few times where I've walked away feeling like I'm, I'm really telling the stories I'm wanting to tell. Um, this image happened the same day that this image happened of the young kids right here. Um, I first went and made that image. And sometimes the universe blesses you with more than one image a day. 
and I'm just like really happy that those things happen. Um, I made that image and I'm like, okay, these guys are like, they're obviously like, they probably don't want to be bothered. But the lighting was so beautiful and they're just chilling. So I like built up the courage like I always do and it always takes some time um, to just kind of approach them. And one thing that I'm not sure if I mentioned it already, but the way we're able to connect is through our relationship to labor, right? Like you name a job, I've done it. Uh, from landscaping, poultry factories, um, washing dishes. I'm able to connect with them through that way where it's like, what's your story? What do you do for a living? And that's kind of breaks that barrier. Because I show up with this, with this backpack with my cameras. It's like, who are you, dude? Um, but I'm able to like make common ground. And, um, and uh, again, these are two Guatemalan men. The young boy is the gentleman in the blue sun. Um, and I, what I found really beautiful about this whole situation is they're prepping the leaves for tamales. And the, and the mother is working indoors, making the dough for the tamales. So it's like this whole family involved thing, but they're enjoying a beer after a long day of work, right? And that beautiful moment of just like being human and just relaxing and resting. Um, and the lighting was just doing what it was doing. And um, yeah, they just gave me this really, this gaze that that really showed their trust in me, right? And like that, I really, I re that's really so important in my process. How can I show that this is a collaboration? Like I'm not just going in here making the image and bouncing. It's like we learned about each other and we're telling these stories together. Um, so yeah, thanks for letting yeah, me talk like about that Yeah, I see a little bit of like vulnerability there and I'm like, wow, that's, I remember that with my uncles a little bit, yeah. Thank you. You've touched on it a bit, and I'm also first generation. I still have a lot of family that's migrating over here. And you touched a bit on the assimilation and that pressure for assimilation. And definitely in my community, that's almost like the utmost important is to assimilate. And even if you are in these positions where you're doing these hard labor jobs to pass off as if you're not. Um, and I'm wondering if you went through subjects that showed that resistance to show this, this side of their lives, which is a beautiful side, and it's a hardworking and just very courageous side to you know sacrifice where they came from, what they knew, to go into a, a living that is living to work and not working to live. And they're resistant to showing that and how you dealt with that. I just want to make sure I, I understand your question correctly. You're asking me if how my subjects resist to assimilating? No, if they resisted to portraying themselves like this and how you were, if there were many instances of that or if you, know, you were able to find a lot of communities that didn't have that kind of resistance to being able to show this side of them. You know, more often than not, I get yes and I think that's a very personal privileged position to be because I hear a lot of stories of portrait photographers who are so used to the nose. I do get the nose. Um, but I think the, the way we're able to make common ground really gives me access to them. And it's like a big responsibility once they have, I, once I have that yes, it's like how can I paint you in the best light possible? But yeah, for sure, I think, I think I have experienced these feelings of like, uh, they've just gone off work and they want to be painted and like they want to get dressed up they want to look all dolled up and there's that I, can, I, can I change and I think I try to express the beauty of that that normalcy right of the of that that wardrobe of like whatever labor like and sometimes sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't but I have seen some of that, where it's like, I want to show, I want to be shown in a different light. Right. Yeah. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. Thank you.
Thank you, guys. Um, my question is, you know, you have these photographs and these people have said yes. How often have they been able to see this in this type of setting? Yeah, so I've had the opportunity. It's not, it's not often, but I have some, some of my subjects come to my previous exhibitions and they never step foot in a gallery. Um, one of my one of the things that I aim to do is like both share the images dig digitally, um, but it's definitely a challenge to get them in here, right? For instance, Maria, who lives in South Carolina, like that's such a hard thing that I've told her about the show. Um, and then there's like this nervousness of being in spaces like this. Um, but yeah, there's been a mix of things, like of people who, the majority of them have never, I don't think, I don't think they, they fully grasp that their image is going on a wall in this format. And um, I think another thing that's important to talk about is like ex accessibility and like creating spaces that are accessible to people from a different demographic, right? So I think we're, we're fairly privileged to be able to come here and enjoy an artist's talk, right? But a lot of people work these, these very heavy labor jobs and they just want to rest. Um, um, but yeah, I think I, I'd love to have all of them in here to see their picture up on the wall. Um, and it doesn't always happen, but uh, I try to share as much as the process of, of and like install shots of like what we, what we built together. Thank you for sharing that. It's, it's also really um, refreshing hearing you talk about that gaze and people having the opportunity to see it in this context. Because when I'm looking at all the images, there's a very unifying bullseye-ish factor that all of them share where it feels like they're working in cohesion. So it almost feels like they all knew that this is exactly how the show was going to turn up and <laughs> I'm the only one that didn't know. And like I said something funny and they all stopped what they were doing to look at me. <laughs> So it's also interesting thinking back about how your your journey from painting and wanting to end up in the moving image and documentary and focusing on these snapshots came to play because they all looks like they are all 1000% know what each other is doing right now. And it's just like one single moment, even though hearing you talk about each of these experiences and walking through every single subject through what the idea and the thing is. and um. I'm interested to, to see how, I think somebody talked about it before, but how you're planning on activating these groups of images beyond this space? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, wanna, I guess I wanna talk about the gaze first, expand on that, where it's like, it's almost like I'm here acknowledging you as the viewer, what conversation are we having, right? And I think that was such, that was such an important element into this, where it's like, I hope that these images challenge you to kind of, your preconceived notions of what this experience might be, right? To really think about who these people are and what, what, how they make a living their day to day or how they, how they um, I'm always thinking about how privileged we are, right? Like that we get to make art, that we, we literally have, I work for a nonprofit, right? It's taken me a lot of work to be here, but that's not the reality of 99% of the world. So putting these stories up here and kind of challenging you as a viewer to think about this other, these other realities that exist out there. Um, how this work moves forward, I'm constantly thinking about how to get more eyeballs on it. I think one of my long-term goals is to make, for this to culminate in a book, to push it in video format, and to also, like, how can I engage the community more? Like, I, I think I've, I shared this conversation with someone, they're like, imposter syndrome, mm -hmm. where it's like, I always feel like I'm not doing enough, right? So I'm like constantly thinking of like, how can I, how can I make this more accessible? How, how can I really bring it back to the people that I'm doing this for? Thanks for your question. Any other questions? Did I see? Oh, oh I'm back there. We'll go after you after. Hola. Hola. I'm here just to say thank you for the uh, mocha to, to have you here. 
um, you have no idea the feeling. I just want to congratulate you, the entire staff. I'm just new to, you know, joining this space. But this visibility is absolutely what we need. We are in a very critical moment. And I think that this is amazing. And I'm excited. So thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart because I really recognize my people all over. This is what we need. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Thank you. I think we had one question up here too. Your edit for this exhibit is very tight. What was the editing process like and out of the images that we see in this exhibit, how many are part of the project that we've not seen? You've actually seen a good like 80% of this work. Um, from the moment of this, of me getting the news that I oh, it was a working artist project, all of this is new. So it's from August until the, almost the, the last day I could work in February. And then it needed to be printed and framed. Um, and I wanted to make sure you got a glimpse of as much work that I was making. And I think that video piece kind of fills that gap of like, these images that they're making into the wall, but give you some context of what's happening. I, earlier I was telling you about the challenges of photographing in winter and learning to work in those conditions and that lighting and just kind of like trying new things. So all this is fairly new work. Um, most of it made it. Um, but in previous um, exhibitions, most portraits, I make minimum 10 portraits of a single individual at a very minimum from different angles, different gazes, uh, different focal lengths. And then the editing happens of like what's communicating the most effectively what I'm trying to say or at least the story of that individual. And uh, one last more of a comment than anything. The, uh, the picture of the young man on the bike if you back here, if you look at it, it's a man on a bike. If you look closely, the bike says revolt. Does am I reading too much into that? Uh, or, what I didn't are your even, thoughts on that? I didn't even know it said revolt. <laughs> 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 but thank you. That only adds to it. Um, <laughs> that's a very special um, um, trailer park complex. That's where my dad and my uncle first lived in, in one of those homes. And I frequent that spot to just kind of circle back to where it all began. Um, and Carlos here was kind enough to, to give me a portrait that day. He happens to live in there. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Got one more question back there. Um, I'm just um, um, curious to see what what influences you uh, creatively, photographers, uh, art, film. I'm just curious to see what your um, foundation is of uh, as an art maker, as a visual thinker. What is uh, um, the art that you that you look at? Because I think as a as a visual thinker, I feel like you always have to look at other people's art. Uh, either painting, drawing, whatever it is, what do you what do you do daily to continue to be an art maker, a maker of images? Because I feel like artists constantly have to be. We live in a very visual world today. You know, uh, I think about when I was your age. You know, I had to go to the library to go look for photography books, um, and and today you could Google whatever you want and and you could kind of be stimulated to to think and so how do you go about your process and making images or constantly keeping because everybody has a phone uh, all of us take pictures but not not all of us could call ourselves photographers so how, what do you do what's your process i'm just curious thanks for that question javi you know i love art so i am constantly consuming art um, 
I look at painters, I look at sculptors, I look at other photographers, um, just to name drop, you know, uh, Guadalupe Rosales over in LA, the way she's making these beautiful archives, Jennifer Packer, who's a fantastic painter, um, Dina Lawson, fantastic photographer. Like, I'm constantly thinking about those, these major influences, but also sometimes you have to draw the line because you get so caught up in what everyone is making, although it's, it's important to be informed. But I think, I think I've kind of found this visual language where it's like, right now, it's helping me tell this story. And I have so much work to do. So it is important for me to kind of be um, taking in new work, but also like, I'm like, folk, I'm like, happen to be in a point where I'm like, actually not looking at that much work. I'm like focused on this, this mission of like, this work needs to grow. Uh, so it's gonna be a very busy summer. Yeah, thanks Javi. Any last questions? All right, well thank you Jose. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for being here, thank you.